Hi everyone, welcome to, the, to this specially curated masterclass, which is part of NUS Open House 2022. We would like to remind you to please set your phone to silence to minimize any disruption. With that, we would like to welcome Dr. Joe Chow, who will be asking the question, is utilitarianism viable as public policy? Dr. Chow, please. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Uh, very warm welcome to the open house today. And as mentioned, we're going to talk about utilitarianism and 
as a public cloud key. And shortly, you'll see what that means. Before we do that, I want to do a quick poll. So hopefully, you can uh, enter this poll with your phones in a second. And uh, the poll is going to get you to think about the following scenario. Okay. So imagine now you are a policy decision maker. And you have the three distributions available to you here. So you can see distribution one, group A, group B, group C, group D. They get the same amount of money. This is, this is in dollars. Group two, there's some uneven distribution, which totals up to 8,400. And in group three, there is more unequal distribution, which adds up to $11,300. So just take a second to familiarize yourself with these three distributions. On the next slide, I'm going to ask a question, which distribution would you prefer to choose? So let's take 30 seconds to take a look at this. On the next slide, you're going to make a choice. Okay, so hopefully you are familiar with that. I can go back to it in case you haven't. And now I would like to ask you which distribution would you prefer? And you can join in either using the link here, oev.com slash no child or text no child to 8241 So some answers coming in, and just to quickly refresh your memory, A is where everyone gets the same amount of money, B is where there's some uneven distribution, but not as much as C. So let's take another 40 seconds or so to make your choice. Okay, so and as the numbers come in, anyone want to quickly share? Why you chose what you chose, E or C, or maybe you might want to choose A, but you, you didn't have a chance to answer the poll. Anybody? Why B or C? All right. I don't know if you always do this, but I guess I have to get some engagement. So maybe, yes, can you share? Why what you choose? Uh, I see. So the thought would be that you might want more prosperity, right? So then you still might get my incentivize people to work harder, right? Okay. Anyone chose B? Want to say why? Well, don't worry. If you have thoughts, feel free to chime in later. I'm going to get you to do another poll, which is a, a something a bit different. Right, so here I'm going to ask you to think about okay, today you're going to find out what you want, what opportunities are available for you at anywhere. But suppose after a very good education at anywhere, okay, you have a well paying job. Now you have some discretionary money. What would you like to do with that money? So here are a few options available to you. You can see them from A to five. And take your time to choose. Let's take about 30 seconds again to make a choice. Okay, and as we are choosing, making an important decision. Anyone else want to share? Why did you choose what you chose? Anybody? 
I see maybe some prospective students with their parents, right? So maybe that's one reason. Are you going to take your parents out to reward them for like, taking care of you for so many years, right? It's a nice one to take. What other reasons? Anybody? Why why would you choose to donate uh invest your personal investment or donate anything? Well, all of these options I think are, are there's some good reason, right? One and one reason and another, right? You think, okay, good to invest in a global pool, good to help also with your personal investment to grow your wealth to help yourself in the later in the future. I guess the most popular choice now. Taking your parents out on holiday is a good option too, as I discussed, and providing money for your child's education is also important right, to make sure that your child has a good future. So lots of possibilities. Right? Now here is let's go back to the first four for a second right, and revisit one reason that we heard just now this idea that D3 maximizes the overall wealth in the economy. There's a thought in that it incentivizes people who work hard to maybe provide more or work harder in that society. So that assuming that there is some kind of relationship between wealth and uh, people's well-being or what they what they like, D3 maximizes that. Right? It, of all the three available uh, distributions, D3 maximizes the well-being. So there's a reason to choose D3. Right? There's a reason to choose D3 over the others at the top. So today we want then to look at this idea of maximizing well-being, which we call utilitarianism. Then we're going to re examine the response to utilitarianism and look at a puzzle that emerges from it. Okay. So utilitarianism, as I briefly saw outlined. Is this idea that the morally right action is action that produces the most good? So D3 produces the most good, at least in one sense, right? Like I mentioned, promoting the well being of the society. So, in that sense, it's superior to D1 and D2. But of course, you might ask, well, what is the most good? We assume, if you recall, that money has some kind of relationship with well being, which, of course, is not a very far fetched relationship, right? The more money you have, the better your life tends to go in a way. But of course, that's not always the case, right? Some rich people might still not always be feel happy, for example. And that is one of the that is what we classical utilitarianism thinks is important, right? Maximizing well-being is to increase the overall happiness in the society. Of course, happiness is a bit subjective. Right? One person can what is happiness to someone might not be happiness to someone else. So, in more contemporary or more uh, more in refined treatments, utilitarianism is known as this idea of well being. This idea that what makes you happy does not always promote your well being. Right? So, for example, I like to drink a lot of sugary drinks, right? like Coke, for example. That makes me happy, but that's not necessarily good for my well being. So two other features of utilitarianism are worth noting. First, it is impersonal, meaning that it doesn't, it's not concerned about the subjective state of people. It's concerned about maximizing the overall well-being. And so it is impartial, right? meaning that it does not care about, it's not concerned with your personal ties or friends or things. What is important is the overall well-being or happiness or well-being in that society. Right? Personal ties are not that important. Which brings us back, I think, to, if you recall, question two. So now I want you to switch your thinking a bit. Right? Suppose now that we research from anywhere and from other universities, social scientists as well as psychologists come together to have a measure of well-being, which we call utils. Right? And actually, it 
economists, political scientists, and many other theories actually use this idea of beauty, which and then we also use this in also in uh, global development science to understand the impact of various policies. So you just basically saying that how is your life going? So now the thought is that the utilitarian want to maximize utility, maximize beauty, meaning that we want to make sure that the world has as much beauty as possible. It doesn't, it, as I already mentioned, utilitarianism is not concerned about your personal ties, your friendships, etc. So now, with that in mind, let's revisit question two. What would a utilitarian say you should choose? Let's take 30 seconds or 40 seconds to answer this question. Okay, so the, the idea is that utilitarians want to maximize well being, meaning maximize the number of beauties. Okay, so as the results come in, let's review the idea. So, here the question is asking you what the utilitarian will say you should choose, right? When the utilitarian is most concerned with increasing the number of beauties in the world, which, okay, so some people chose with one million beauties, right? That's all, makes sense, right? But the talk for the utilitarian. They are most concerned with maximizing long term the number of beauties. So G is arguably one of the, the, the most recommended, right? Maybe E might be recommended as well, right? If I hear that. Because if you think about it in the short term, right? Because now it's only 30 years later that you get such a big number. But maybe in the short term, that is going to be more. Let's take a second to reflect on how drastically different this graph is with the previous one. When I ask you to think about what you would choose to do, what the utilitarian tells you to do is drastically different. Overwhelmingly, many of you would no, you would choose to more maximize utilitarianism, uh, utility, which means that it seems to go against many of our strongest beliefs that if I make some money, why not take my parents to a holiday? Yes, the correct thing to do, right? They support me throughout my life, right? And that is, I should pay them for that. Right? Why not invest my money for my children's benefit? My children matter to me. Utilitarianism, in other words, seeks to go against this idea that our personal ties are deeply important. That comes from the fact that it is impartial, right? If you recall what I mentioned just now, this idea that it's not concerned about our personal ties, about our friendships, it's concerned first and foremost with maximizing utility. And so then the thought is that. We can maximize if we can allocate more resources right, to maximizing utility. We should we should not go for promoting or diverting these resources to our friends, our family, and so on. Right, which is a counterintuitive idea. Right? Hopefully, you get to see some of the the the, the strange nature of action that utilitarianism is recommending. And that, as I mentioned, comes from this the fact that utilitarianism is impersonal, it's care to move about the numbers, it's impartial, meaning it doesn't care about your personal ties, and it's calculating in a way, right? It's trying to say, well, what should we get? How can we maximize that utility in the first place? In the mean form, right? Here's the idea, right? Utilitarianism will say, if your friend 
is not giving enough liquidity to you or the world, then you should go and find another friend. Right? But as the as the mean there is nicely illustrated, right? You think that this is not the best kind of behavior, right? To say that this is unethical is an understatement, right? To, 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 to abandon your friend because another friend can bring about more utility to you or the world is kind of you're not being a good friend. That's the idea. And many utilitarians, academic philosophers, are actually very concerned about this. Right? So there are many papers about this issue. Just to show you that this is something that is a deep philosophical and scholarly concern. So in short, utilitarianism seems to be a good way of thinking about all the right? If you recall, at least this idea that D3 is better than D2 and D1. That seems to be a good talk about how to organize society, right? maximize well being. That's good, right? Why would that be bad? But at the same time, it seems to also lead to this problem that it tells us to abandon our personal ties right? in favor of maximizing utility. That would mean that we have to live, live radically different kinds of lives at the very least. So how can we move forward? Right? So typically in the literature, people have sort of two answers. One is to say, oh, utilitarianism, we should just abandon it. Another is to try to save utilitarianism, right? Save it in the sense that show that it doesn't lead to this kind of absurd stuff. Another is to say, okay, utilitarianism is not a good guide to personal conduct, meaning that. We shouldn't use it to think about how to live our lives, but it is a good guide to public conduct. This is the kind of idea, right? That we don't have it as a personal moral philosophy, but it can be one that guides our general society. Okay. So now we come to a question, right? What kinds of rules of thumb should public officials follow in thinking of public policy? Anyone? How should, if you are a policy maker, right, how do you want our politicians to make public policy decisions? Okay, right. So why why is maximization of social well-being important? Good, right? So the idea is that in a democratic society, there is some kind of relationship, not, not, a, not necessarily always a fixed one, but the idea is that people's well-being is generally related to uh, trying to maximize that kind of social well-being, right? So then public officials should try to do that. Okay, what else? But how should they go about maximizing the social well-being? That's the question that I also want to ask. What, what what should go through their head? Okay, good, right? Minimizing suffering and deprivation. That might require them to be calculated, right? We think about what a specific policy is likely to do, right? Examine various options. And you might also think that they should be neutral, right? Why is that important? Because if you want to minimize suffering, if you want to make sure that you are responsive to as many people as possible, you should try to be as impartial as possible. And you should try to consider what the outcomes of your actions are going to be, and then evaluate them based on, on that basis. So then the thought is that. You should choose actions that maximize the public good right, by being by trying to anticipate what's likely to happen. Interesting thing here is that at least on this view, utilitarianism seems to match up nicely with what you want from the public official. In a way, right, it is we want our public officials to be impartial, in fact, right, to not 
play favorites, we're not favor one group over another. We want them to be calculated and we want them to think if I institute policy A over policy B, what is likely to happen? And what is going to happen to the people? That's a very important question. So the thought is that while utilitarianism is not the best guide of trying personal conduct, as we saw, it might be very good for guiding public conduct. That's the kind of idea. Right? So utilitarianism seems more suited for guiding how public officials should think about policy making rather than using it as an individual guide to how to live your life, which will sometimes lead to very bad consequences for your private life. That's the idea. Okay. So, but then now the question comes to seek out the we come back to this question here, yeah, right? Which is okay, so we know we should maximize something. But what is that something? You know, clear. So we recall that we had two versions from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, this idea that there's happiness and well being. So let's look at this. So here's one sort of very long argument for why you should maximize well being and not happiness, but I'll just summarize it in a sentence or two. Idea comes back to what we discussed earlier. What makes people happy is often subjective. It's dependent upon your personality, your circumstances, your group upbringing, and so on. But public policy is not made to cater to the whims and fancies of every single individual. We cannot possibly build a highway and then we say, oh, can you have a taxi to my house specifically? And then, oh, can, I, can you also cater to uh, and exit so that I can go to the shop easily, it will be impossible. Right? That's the idea. Public policy should be suited to the general public. And so the thought is that well being, right? what determines our well being, that is pretty general. Without water, without shelter, without proper health care, over time, our well being will generally deteriorate for almost all of us. So the idea is that rather than maximizing happiness, which is subjective, we should aim at maximizing well-being. Okay. That sort of seems to nicely solve the problem of this question. But of course, that doesn't really solve the problem. Right? Because while it's easy to say that everyone needs shelter, everyone needs water, everyone needs public health, Still, we still need to know something about your preferences to solve your well. Here's an easy example. All of you are here today to meet a very important component of your well education. But you are here to learn about what kind of education will be good for you, right? Whether PP is good for you, geography, political science, so many options. One way that we can tell what will suit your well being is directly to ask you, right? What will suit you? So, so there is some kind of relationship right, between how your life will go and your preferences. Sometimes the best way to improve someone's well being is just to ask them rather than guess or try to do something that you think would be in their in their benefit. Right? But of course. That seems to lead to another kind of problem. If we maximize across self reported preferences, that seems to lead to, to a, um, another kind of issue. I'm going to quickly illustrate this now. The idea that you can simply revise your preferences to get what you want. Right? Here's a sort of like academic treatment of it. Right? Here's a, you might hear again say, if you cannot get what you want, then you just change your preferences so they can easily get what you can get. One more you can get. I will illustrate this now with two examples. Here, as all of us know, we have not really been able to travel. Right? So this is a scene in the itinerary in the region. Right? All of us know we have not been able to travel. So one solution that you will see recently in the newspaper is to say, Okay, you cannot go to New Zealand, it's okay. You can always go to somewhere that looks like New Zealand, but 
parties in Singapore. Of course, I see of you, all of you laughing, and that is illustrates nicely the problem, right? This idea that if you can't get what you want, then just change your preferences. You can't go to New Zealand, then like something in Singapore. That, that's kind of second best idea. And then here is an academic illustration of this idea, right, where the fox cannot get the grapes, so the fox says, oh, the grapes must be sour. That's a famous fox illustration here. But of course, right, now we can ask one additional question. Is revising your preferences according to circumstances always bad? Anyone? Good, right? So you might think when COVID 19 hit, right, we might have to change our preferences, but that's okay, right? After all, if the circumstances change, then our preferences should also change, right, in light of new information. But then the worry would be that they are engaging in some kind of self protection. So that's the end of Let's look at some questions, right? Now I'm going to ask you to get you to do another poll. Now, some of the questions might be triggering so if you feel that you cannot answer them don't do that but if you can do free to answer that so the first question i want to ask you is now suppose that uh, and this is done in a lot of public health economics so suppose that you have we are using a scale of zero to one in increments of zero point one to measure individuals quality of health so as i mentioned in public health economics we do this all the time so what do you think a typical Singaporean's health-related quality of life is? So we'll call this the control group. So basically I'm asking you, imagine every Singaporean on a scale of 0 to 1, the increments of 0 0.1, meaning 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, so on and so forth. What is the average Singaporean's health-related quality of life? And you can answer that question here. Okay, we'll move on to the next question in about another 10 seconds. As you can see, it's about clustering around 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, 0 0.7 being the most common answer. Okay, next, using that same scale, what do you think the quality of life of someone who has lost this answer is? So as more answers come in, you see basically a shift towards the left side, right? More clustering around 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Okay. Now, last question. Now imagine we conducted a survey right, of those who lost this cancer and asked them to give us a self-report. Do you think that if a year after the event, do you think they give the same answer, higher or lower? Okay, so overwhelmingly, people say higher. Right? So, right quickly, to close up, what top, why, why, what choice did you make and what, maybe? Okay, yes. Good, right? So they accept it and they just move on. Rest in right? But, and here's kind of like some evidence that suggests this is true. Right? So here's a few studies which say that 
如果让别人去 overall the computer reach the top baseline of the level. We don't have time to play this video, but basically what this video explains is that there is this psychological process of which we call hedonic adaptation. It is basically this, this idea that we have a sort of baseline of well-being which we return to after bad events and also after good events. Right? So people who win the lottery, they are very happy, they report high levels of happiness. Over time, they return back to the baseline of the lower point of happiness. Okay, so why is this important? Why do I spend so much time talking about this? Go back to this idea of determination of public philosophy. This idea that while it seems to be odd, because of the reason we talk about self perception allowing people to change their preferences to believe some bad stuff. But at the same time, there's this commonplace phenomenon of hedonic adaptation that leads to this big question, which is how can public officials think about how to better incorporate hedonic adaptation into our thinking about public policy? So there are other things, other bigger questions that emerge from this, right? Is it always true that hedonic adaptation is good? One question that is raised just now, right, about self-deception is an important question to ask. Another interesting question that we might ask is what does this mean for economic growth? Right? So we if we remember at the very beginning of the class, we said more growth means that typically people's lives go better. But if people very quickly get used to a certain material level of material wealth, then is it true that their lives have gone significantly better? What does it mean for how we think about economic growth? If you are interested in thinking about these questions and more, these are questions that I explore in my honors class, but also in my 2000 PPE class. And there are future classes that touch on some of the issues that we're going to discuss. If you want to reach out, you can take a picture of this information here or you can have further questions. Thank you, everybody. So we would like to open the floor now for any questions that you have. And please keep your questions on And You may use the mic on either side of the aisle. And for Zoom participants, you may put your questions on the Zoom Q&A or chat function. Uh, what do you mean by pragmatism? Um, like in general? So there might be there, there might be a few different differences if we think about pragmatism and moving things that are more useful for us. So one one very clear thing is that pragmatism might be a good fit for both personal conduct and public conduct. Because the thought may be that as an individual, what is useful to you uh, can can be quite can encompass a whole range of things. Like Relationships. Whereas utilitarianism is more about this impersonal calculation of what is well being to everybody. So it might not, uh, it doesn't, it has this, it still has that kind of impersonal kind of nature to it. Whereas pragmatism, on the way that you have defined it, has one kind of important, what we can call indexical function, meaning that 
what is useful is always indexical, meaning that what is useful to me is not useful to you, what is useful to Singapore is not what is useful to the US, what is useful to Malaysia is not what is useful to Vietnam, and so on and so forth. So, but whenever we apply the term, the general idea of do what is useful, then we just necessarily we must have that kind of investment function. Utilitarianism doesn't want to have that kind of induction function. It just says maximize well being. And where well being is just the various parties involved. So I hope that is that helpful. Now, that's a complex question. So let's actually separate them into a few questions first. So one question you can ask is, in a population of people with relatively similar context and material well-being, do their baselines differ? And that's a very interesting question, which um, so far, we don't really have very good data on. Now, you know, meaning that it's not entirely clear whether uh, the data doesn't fully support that idea. But that what there is is pretty good data which suggests that different people with different uh, personality types right, tend to take longer to return to a baseline. So that's one of the clear data. Whether people have different baselines is not very clear. The reason why it's not very clear is because it, this is a long standing problem in economics, in philosophy of politics, and economics as well. What is my well being scale and what your well being scale and their well being scale, and his and hers, we don't know. There's just no way to actually get a fixed scale. This is a big problem that, they, that uh, economists and philosophers and Possible scientists can't really resolve because it's very unclear. I, I can say how are you bring today seven, but my seven and your seven, is it the same? We really don't know because it depends on so much. So that's one thing. Second question that you asked, interesting question about the relationship between economic growth and economic adaptation. Now again, what we can attribute to economic adaptation and what we cannot. That's a very difficult question to, to tease up right? because what might make Singaporeans more seem more unhappier than, than, than citizens from a developing country are subject to a wealth of what in the in, in social science we call confounding factors, meaning that they might be exposed to a lot of high stress situations, or they might be exposed to a lot of other kinds of environmental factors. Which might have a relationship with that. So it's not, uh, it's not entirely clear whether that has been the case. But what we do know from some studies in the developing countries is that there are incidences of people getting used to uh, sustained periods of material, uh, material deprivation. Right? So they don't have enough food, they don't have enough shelter. So that might suggest. That, uh, that might be happening. But of course, we don't really know whether that's happening at a sort of population wide scale. Because we actually know that economic deprivation does happen, especially to uh, groups, like for example, women who might be relatively deprived compared to, say, men in, in a particular society. 
but we don't know whether population Y whether it's going to be right. Right. Oh, back up. Oh. Could you repeat again why changing practices to keep existing resources in the event might not necessarily be a bad thing? Yeah. Good. So, so so, one thought that you might have, which is not, which is not, um, the idea is something like this that under certain sets of situation, it's quite likely that our preferences will change. Right? So, one very clear kind of example that we discussed just now is this idea of right? under COVID 19, we have a set of restrictions, right? Which restrict our movement, which restrict sometimes also our ability to socialize and things like that. So then the thought is that under certain conditions, psychologically at least, it does make sense to adapt some of our preferences in order for us to evolve and maintain a, a new equilibrium, if you will, right? a new new set, a set point for our world. So in some cases, that does seem to be helpful, right? and in the COVID-19 case, I think it's the one that the clearest, right? We had a period when we couldn't go out with our friends and family, then we had to convince and we had to tell ourselves, okay, it's okay. This is to keep us in generally safe and to help us to achieve a new normal. Right? The, phrase, the, the phrase, a new normal, already suggests that something here, right? which is that we need to accept certain kinds of changes in our lives so that we can continue with normality. But of course, as you notice, that leads to certain kinds of problems that we discussed just now, which is that this process of adaptation might also underlie certain uh, bad negative implications. So some people are actually worried about this right, during COVID-19, right? That what if we become so used to not socializing, not going out, then we hit this new baseline, and then we don't want to do the things that we used to enjoy anymore. So initially, when there were lockdowns, especially in the US and other countries, many people had this concern right, that this will happen. But of course, you can you can contrast that whether that's correct or not, right? You can debate about that. But in other clear cut cases, like let's say someone doesn't have enough food, but they slowly come to say, oh, okay, I'm okay, I'm, I'm still healthy, or I'm still getting enough food nutrition, right? that kind of adaptation seems to lead to clearly negative implications for the world. So I hope that answers the question. Any further questions? We have come to the end of our session. Thank you very much for taking your talk. If you have pre-registered for the walking tour, please head out to the tour booth outside LT11 to begin your tour. Due to safe management measures, we have limited capacity for these tours and only accept to sign up. However, feel free to take a walk around our campus or take a shuttle bus to U-Town and take part in the other activities throughout the day. Thank you.